Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Brad Topol, Tong Lee, Mark Volker. Uh, we are here to talk about the uh, OpenStock interoperability uh, challenge and in the interoperability workgroup updates. Uh, the adventure continues. Uh, so if you look at the interrupt challenge, um, what, what were we looking at? Uh, it's a way for vendors to, you know, demonstrate. Is this bigger? Does it? Uh, I can't read it on your screen. Oh, you wanna? Well, I can't read the half size. You wanna step over? See that? That would be brilliant. I can do that. Mm -hmm. Much easier. Um, so I can actually read this now. Well, let's, you know, so it's a way for vendors to demonstrate their their clouds, the way they work with um, uh, core applications, basically. Uh, it was a holistic approach. In the, in the original interrupt challenge, what did we want to prove? Well, we wanted to prove that we had interoperability with OpenStack, and we wanted to prove that uh, one of the things we were getting dinged on by the analysts was, well, let's see us run some enterprise applications. So we, we generated reference applications, workloads. These are all publicly available in our repository. Uh, we were starting to work with the App Ecosystem Workgroup and, and, and do some work there. And as we had challenges that were identified, you know, you know as we found other people that, that wanted to, to be uh, participating, we included them as well. So we grew a, a really nice community way back when. Um, again, when we first started this out, what did we look at? Uh, we looked at some Docker Swarm and we looked at LAMP stack. Uh, just some nice applications, and we hit a lot of bumps, right? You, you can see on the right what we were trying to, to, to make, you know, a lot of the key ref stack uh, capabilities we wanted to retest and make sure everything was working. So, you know, all the things you'd expect to see in an enterprise app, the VM provisioning, uh, security rule management, uh, volume creation, attaching, detaching, uh, public and private IP addresses, load balancing, network security rules, um, lots of interesting stuff, and of course, software install on top of OpenStack. Um, if you look at what we proved in phase one, we showed that you know, the cloud ecosystem was interoperable. We had 16 companies. They took the stage to demonstrate uh, you know, live portability of the workloads. Uh, we had a lot of good press, a lot of good analysts from Barcelona when, when we did this. Um, so then again, when we started phase two, uh, we went to the community for input. Uh, that seemed to be the most fair way to say, well, what, what, really, what do we need to focus on for interoperability? And uh, you can see where all the greens are, right? The community came back, the folks that were interested really wanted to see Kubernetes, really wanted to see NFV. Um, then we came to phase two. And we got a lot of requests, uh, a little shock to the team. You know, we had people merrily on a very calm roadmap of Kubernetes, and very quickly we were asked to jazz it up. Uh, jazz it up meaning, well, why don't you try a CoreOS image and get out of your comfort zone of, of an Ubuntu image, and why don't you think about, uh, you know, running multi-cloud and CockroachDB on top, wouldn't that be cool? Um, and you know the foundation, uh, it's their keynote stage, and if you wanna be on their keynote stage, you're gonna take their input in their direction. So uh, they set the bar very, very high, um, and uh, I know it caused all of us a little bit of stress. Uh, I don't know, Mohammed, you seem pretty calm. <laughs> Nothing stresses you, uh, but some of us were very stressed um, and uh, kept very busy. Now in the background, and there was another presentation on this, um, there was the, the uh, NFV work. So there was still NFV work. It didn't make the main stage. There was a separate presentation for that here. Um, but a lot of cool stuff going on in the NFV space to show interoperability when you take OpenStack and you apply it to that domain, those workloads. So it didn't make the main stage, but incredibly cool stuff going on. Uh, very cool uh, voice over IP demos kind of things and calling people on the a lot of cool stuff going on in the NFE work as well. Um, again, how do you do this? Uh, so 
you got layered things. You got CockroachDB, uh, you know, it's a multi-world distributed database that gives you uh, full transactional capability, so it's a little different than your traditional NoSQL databases that, that get scale by uh, giving up on transactions and having eventual consistency or what have you. So it's a different model, it's pretty interesting, and of course Kubernetes. Um, the key things for making sure uh, OpenStack is interoperable, uh, you know, we use, we gotta find the right tools. Uh, there's a lot of different tools out there for automated deploy. And we can all have a theoretical conversation, a philosophical conversation on which automated deploy tool is best. But when it's time to get this gentleman up on stage and this gentleman over here up on stage and these two great folks up on stage and say, what's going to work? We all got to run the same automated deployment. What's going to work on all 16 clouds? Um, Ansible really becomes the answer that works on all the clouds. You know, there are some other options out there that we're, you know, happy to talk about. So we can kind of do a little stream of consciousness. Well, you know, somebody say, well, why didn't you use OpenStack Heat? Well, you go to your 16 clouds and you say, how many people have deployed Heat? <laughs> Maybe a couple hands go up. Not a lot. And again, when, you're, when your measurement is 16 people are going to have to run this on stage, well, you know, you toss it out. Um, there's also another great tool called Terraform. Uh, Terraform is, is nice if, you know, you need a layer to connect to different cloud infrastructures, um, but it had some issues. So on some of the clouds we had, they had multi-version endpoints for their compute services. Well, when Terraform saw that, it kind of freaks out and goes, I don't know what to do. There's version two, version 2.1, yeah. Right, so you know we had several clouds that, that couldn't use Terraform, and that bug had been around in Terraform for quite a while. Um, the other thing that I know Tong kept explaining to me over and over and over was, well, you know, I can do this work in Terraform, Brad, but what about the software config on top? I'm going to end up using Ansible for that, and so now I've got this one tool underneath that doesn't run on all the clouds, and then I've got this Ansible on, you know, and I still got to do this Ansible on top. You know, if you really liked me, we'd use Ansible for everything. It runs on all the clouds. Um, I can do the, the one piece this way, and then I can easily put the Ansible on top. And I'm sure Tong told me that five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. <laughs> I got it on the first time, but it, it's good to hear him have to force to explain it to me again. Um, so, so, you know, a lot of lessons that we learned. Um, and, and a lot of choices there, but getting everybody up on stage forces you to make realistic decisions on, uh, you know, not the theoretical of how, what could be interoperable, but what has to be interoperable. Um, you know, some other details here on the NFV. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Tom, do you want to cover some of that real fast? Because you were a little more involved in just the, the, that piece. Mm, actually, I don't know too much about NFV workload. Yeah. yeah, so just basically. We have another session, though. Yeah, they have a whole yeah. other session. Yeah. But, um, you know, with the NFV, there were just certain components um, that the NFV folks run. There are certain extra tools that they use, um, you know, because you want to make phone calls and stuff like that. So you got to get the right stuff set up. It's, it's a little more complicated, but it's very interesting. Um, a lot of great participants. Some were from, from the first one, and they came back. We didn't scare them all off. How many participants are in the room? One green shirt guy? Yeah, anybody else? Okay, oh, only two survived, right? So um, if you look at this group, nice mix. We had room for some new folks. Um, we had some uh, continuing folks, veterans, like the folks you see on the stage here that just wanted to do this again. Um, and, you know, it was kind of neat. It, it was, uh, you know, as you get better at what you're doing, it, it, it's easier that we could have some latecomers come in and actually be able to participate. It wouldn't have been as possible to do that in phase one because you know it was a little rougher patch learning and getting all the things worked out. But with phase two, um, we would figured out a lot of the best practices and you know you, you'd gone through that first level of, of triage of people being able to run. So we did have some latecomers where you know people showed up. Um, you know, pick on somebody. Platform nine came in really late. 
Wind River, I mean, they, the, the, the wind came in incredibly late um, and said, hey, you got that one last spot, we can do this, we want it. And, and we said, sure, right? So that was kind of fun to, to get, you know, get all the numbers up. Um, just an overview of the, the workload. Again, you, you, got, you got your classic, I assume, everybody familiar with Kubernetes? Anybody not familiar with Kubernetes? I know Ton in the back there knows Kubernetes incredibly well. Um, Kubernetes, nice model. Uh, you've got a master node, you've got worker nodes, and you essentially are scheduling these things called pods. Pods contain containers. Uh, think Docker, right? So these pods contain uh, containers that all kind of are related to each other, and they can share uh, mounted volume and share uh, an IP address that comes in, and really nice way in, in, in Kubernetes to, to be able to have a declarative model to say, I want eight replicas, and if something fails, Kubernetes will recognize it, and if you, a couple fail, it'll bring your replicas back up to eight. You don't have to do a lot of work. A lot of built-in nice features uh, with Kubernetes and autoscaling. And so if you look at the model here, you've got your master node running in a VM, um, you got your other VMs provisioned, and they have what are called the, the Kubernetes worker nodes, um, and they've got the pods that are running there, and you can attach your, your volume storage uh, to the VMs, giving the, the pods the volume storage there. So a um, lot going on there, and, and those are the types of uh, characteristics that we were able to, to worry about and test. So you can see Kubernetes install and config, the, the database system deploy, um, the dependency install. The, the neat things here that were a little different, we used a CoreOS image. So you get a little bit of the Docker for free, but then you lose the Python, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's something to think about. When you go, when you're dealing with Ubuntu, Python's typically there, depending on the version. You go to CoreOS, um, and differences, you know, oh, we're gonna make sure the Python's there, but the Docker's there, so that speeds certain things up. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Any other wonderful Easter eggs with CoreOS? Um, no. All right, well, good. Um, got a nice wiki page, keep all our details out there, meetings and what have you. I can assure you we're gonna take a little break after the summit for a while. We'll, <laughs> we'll uh, assess after that um, and, and go after that. So we got a nice wiki page. Um, everything's done out in the public. Uh, uh, workload repositories, you get to see the Ansible scripts, you see how much it is just the same script and a few configuration pieces for the endpoint, credentials, et cetera. Um, and good best practices here that if you want to deliver things across multiple clouds, uh, you can go, go look what's there. We've got, you know, bug tracking and, and these types of things. Um, so lessons learned. I'm going to hand over to Tong. Uh, <coughs> Tong instrumental in making this real. So Tong. Thank ahead. you, Brad. Um, just we have done two times the interoperability uh, challenge. Um, we have learned a lot uh, during the course of, uh, of a year, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Two times. Um, in the first phase, we actually uh, learned a lot of stuff. Uh, on this slide, actually, uh, most of the things we learned from the first phase. Uh, we were able to very quickly to do the second workload is based on what we have learned in the past. Otherwise, that wouldn't be. Uh, uh, that, that fast. Um, so uh, just iterate uh, what on the uh, slide. Um, Ansible actually is a really nice tool uh, to do this type of work. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of uh, cloud operators uh, use Ansible. Um, you know, when you're trying to de uh, actually deploy software and uh, do some configuration, um, you know, when you have your machines up, already up running. It's a, it's a very good tool to use. Uh, Brad mentioned Terraform. Um, I mean, what, what we find is that Terraform is very good for provisioning for, for your cloud. Uh, regardless if it's, it's Amazon or it's, a, you know, um, OpenStack or even Google Cloud, um, you, you can use Terraform provision a lot of nodes in parallel very fast. 
but when you come to configuration the software that you want to run on those VMs, it's a little bit, you know, difficult. Uh, so that's the reason we pick actually the Ansible. We did try both uh, in the first phase. Um, the other problem we actually find um, by doing this on multiple clouds is that uh, um, the neutron implementation is very different uh, from cloud to cloud. Um, we, we find to use shade actually can help you a lot, uh, not only on the networking side, but also on some other uh, components. Um, I think VMware actually uh, taught us this uh, next uh, lesson. And we assumed that when you have a volume attached, it's a VDB, uh, but and that's not the case for all the cloud. Uh, so we added some parameter in the configuration file to allow the workload script actually to uh, specify, um, I mean, to attach the right uh, volume to the virtual machines you created. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if uh, OpenStack actually can be configured <coughs> to make sure that uh, the volume name will be always consistent. No? You mm. can't? Nope. No? <laughs> no, so part of that's um, a guest OS behavior, and no. some of that is attributed to the hypervisor based on, um, like, if you're using Libvirt, um, Libvirt actually talks to uh, the guest OS to plumb that into the, to the VDB. Okay. Um, on other hypervisors, that may show up as just a regular vanilla SCSI adapter, like an LSI logic adapter. Um, so the, the way that shows up to the guest kernel is a little different. Okay. And that's great. And, you know, I mean, these sort of little things you will have to actually do it to find, you know, it could be different from cloud to cloud. Um, the other thing we learned that, uh, you know, we trying to use many different uh, uh, open systems for VM, right? Uh, I mean, even for Ubuntu, you have many different versions. In the early version, when you have your uh, VM up running, your network is ETH0, but now when you use the newer ones, <coughs> now suddenly the network interface card is not called ETH0. Uh, so you have to be prepared to figure out all this dynamically. And uh, I mean, especially when you're trying to set up some security uh, rules, not the neutron security rules, you know, let's say you set up a HA proxy, then you probably need to know your VM's uh, network card name. Uh, so those sort of configuration, you know, you cannot assume you always get that. What's interesting about a couple of those is that they're actually not open stack problems per se. Um, you know, part of, the, part of what we were doing with this interoperability challenge was showing hybrid cloud workloads. We actually took a workload, ran it on a bunch of different clouds, and then made them all work together, right? Mm -hmm. So um, when I talk to folks out in the field um, that have maybe OpenStack in their data center and they're also using a little AWS or a little GC or a little, you know, whatever other cloud, um, in most cases, they have those same issues, right? If I run a uh, Ubuntu 16.04 guest OS um, image in a, in a cloud somewhere, it might use um, uh, predictable network interface naming. And so now I have ENS 3.2 instead of ETH0, right? Yeah. So these are problems that are um, actually pretty consistently something that you'd run into when you're trying to orchestrate applications across any set of clouds. Um, right. And what we've done with the interoperability challenge is really just kind of flush those out you know, for an open stack world. Uh, but these are actually things that are pretty typical for people that are writing cross-cloud applications, no matter what cloud they're using. All right, so, so those lessons we learned actually is very valuable if you really develop your applications based on various different cloud. Uh, the other thing we learned is the network uh, virtualization. Um, you know, um, not all clouds support uh, floating IP, uh, the concept. Um, so you have to be careful that, um, you know, if you assume, okay, when I develop my application, I'm going to have a tenant network. Well, that's not always the case. I mean, that actually uh, um, make, makes me just remember something that we didn't put, uh, uh, I think, on the slides. Um, when we create those workloads, 
we actually purposely uh, create uh, a template for the configuration file. Okay, then we provide the examples how the config configuration file should look like, uh, what should be in it in there and the, what kind of value you should have. Um, now, when we run this thing on multiple cloud, we just tell the operators that, okay, well, for your cloud, you just need to make a copy of this sample configuration file that make a little change, then just use that configuration file. Right? You don't have to you know, go in there, change any of those uh, 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 workload scripts. So you just create a new configuration file, then the workload start running. So I think that actually um, is very nice. Uh, so you don't really touch the code, you just make configuration change. And all the command that actually you run uh, different phases of the work, uh, work workload um, is absolutely identical. <clears throat> I thought that was a very good uh, decision we made. Okay, wow, move on. We have more lessons learned. Uh, and most of those uh, items uh, listed here actually from our <laughs> phase two uh, workload. Um, in the phase one, we actually didn't try even use the core OS image. Um, then, as Brad mentioned earlier, uh, the foundation asked us to you know, try different OS, and then we started using core OS. Of course, we're still trying to support uh, Ubuntu and other um, uh, distributions. <clears throat> that uh, I find that when you set, uh, use the uh, cloud in it to set up the host name, you have to be very careful. You want to use the fully qualified uh, domain name, which is just one little period at the end. If you don't do that, then you get different host name um, if you use different uh, images, okay? So that actually gave me a lot of grief. Uh, and we create uh, actually quite a lot of discussion <coughs> among, you know, um, operators. And funny that uh, later I find on the OpenStack mailing list, actually operators start talking about, okay, now when we configure OpenStack, do we use the um, um, DHCP domain parameter or not, right? Uh, so th those things are actually very valuable to operators, uh, what is the right thing to do when you configure your cloud? Okay, so uh, then when you use the core OS, uh, there's no Python. <laughs> what are you gonna do uh, when you're trying to use Ansible, right? Uh, so you have to try to figure out a way, and the core OS also doesn't have the, like the Ubuntu um, software repository, then you can just do a APT install and it will go. Right, that's not the case. You have to, 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 to find the different ways actually bootstrap your, your VM and then your uh, Ansible will start working, right? Uh, I mean, luckily there are a lot of uh, uh, bootstrap um, code, uh, open source code available. Uh, it just happened and I found the one actually contributed by VMware uh, worked great. So uh, all the instructions also in a document as part of our work, workload. Yeah, these were a couple of these examples are kind of interesting in that um, we made the workload a little bit more complicated than it necessarily had to be by supporting multiple different guest operating systems, um, and that was partly just user preference and and you know trying some new things. Um, you could be very prescriptive on the images. We could have actually picked a standard image for everybody to run, um, but what we see in the real world is that everybody kind of has their own little spins on different images. Um, a lot of folks, um, you know, maybe have uh, security patching requirements, so they want to run the very latest security patches for Ubuntu 16.04, uh, or maybe they need an older Linux kernel for some something that they're doing. Um, so these are these are again kind of real world problems that aren't necessarily specific to OpenStack. Um, but things that we put in the interoperable workload because there are things that uh, you're going to see in the real world if you try to do cross-cloud uh, workloads. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> the other thing we actually, um, I, 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 I don't know if other um, Ansible script developers actually use. Um, <clears throat> this this took me a while to figure this out um, because in the, in the phase one, uh, we, we want to create we, we create actually multiple VMs, but we didn't really paralyze this process. 
we just create one VM after the other. We use the Ansible OpenStack cloud module, right? That you can imagine on some of the cloud to create a VM actually self take a lot of time. So um, that's part of the reason why the the um, the first workload, uh, the LAMP stack we did, uh, took about eight to ten minutes to finish. Um, most of the time, I just spent on creating VMs. And then for this uh, second uh, interrupt challenge workload, we actually paralyzed that. We created the virtual host, and each virtual host actually run exactly the same uh, uh, script to create the VMs. Now we basically paralyze this process, so we can create 20 or 30 VMs, you know, use pretty much at the same time you create, you know, just one VM, okay? So uh, I'm pretty uh, pro pride about this, uh, you know, uh, um, finding that uh, we use for this workload. Um, how we actually do that, you can, you can take a, you know, uh, take a look at the workload, the code. Of course, you can also talk to me if you're interested. Then we, uh, our uh, colleagues from China actually contributed the next patch that uh, added uh, the profile timing plugin to the workload. So if you enable that, uh, when you run the workload at the very end, uh, the workload will produce a very nice, um, you know, uh, report and shows all the times actually spent on particular task. And by default, we'll, we'll just uh, list the top 20 tasks that uh, spend the most of time, right? So this is a very nice uh, 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 tool you can use to figure out actually where, uh, you know, in the process you spend the most time. You can fine tune that if you find, okay, well, when I attach the VM, uh, when I attach the volume to the VM, it takes most time, and you probably can take a look at that and say, hey, why it's happening that way, right? So um, it's very nice. And you probably know that the, the, uh, the workload we did for this time is the Kubernetes um, on top of OpenStack uh, plus the CockroachDB. So what, what I find is that, in, you know, um, Ansible, OpenStack, um, plus Kubernetes can give you a very nice uh, cloud environment, right? You get the VM from the OpenStack, you get containers from a Kubernetes running on top of that, um, and Ansible give you automation, right? This is the tool you need to really run your cloud. Um, of course, you know, um, we just proved that you can use uh, those uh, open source tools to create the workload that can run on multiple cloud, which produce uh, exactly the same uh, uh, result that we have witnessed actually yesterday on stage. So I think I'm running time, running out of time. Uh, did we talk about this already? De deliverables? Uh, pretty much. So let's, let's talk real quick about um, the REST stack uh, piece of this. Um, so the interoperability challenge is really looking at workload portability. Um, so can a, a real life given set of software be run on, on multiple clouds, right? Um, there's another piece of the puzzle here, which is consistent API behavior between open stack clouds. Um, because open stack clouds, it turns out, can be configured a lot of different ways. Um, so as part of this, we actually asked all the participants in the ARP challenge to go run RefStack against their clouds um, and verify um, what, what APIs they support and what Tempest tests they pass um, and whether or not they adhere to the most recent interoperability guidelines from the OpenStack Foundation. Um, and so that was, that was kind of a good data point for us because we actually got information on 15 real life clouds, um, public clouds, private managed clouds, uh, and uh, private distributions. Um, and those have, uh, have been posted as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of the other piece of the puzzle is looking at the consistent API behaviors. Um, you know, we have one workload here. Turns out there are a whole lot of other workloads. Some of them use different APIs than the ones that we did. Um, so that was kind of the, the sort of next step uh, in, in looking at interoperability there. And uh, for those interested, there's a couple more sessions on 
Um, the interoperability guidelines coming up. Uh, I think the next one is at 2.40 today, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so be sure to, to tune into those. Um, let's skip our the rest of the interest of Tong. You want to talk to China? I think, yeah, Tong, this is yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, I think, um, well, this year I have traveled to China a couple of times, and each time I was there, I feel like the OpenStack is heating up. Uh, a lot of people are really interested. Uh, they want to run OpenStack for their company or enterprise or government. Uh, a lot of interest. Um, that's part of the reason, actually, um, um, uh, with my faith, he's sitting right there, his help. We created this uh, open, st open stack interop challenge, China chapter, uh, the past uh, February. Um, then we have uh, people from 10 different companies to join at uh, uh, the, the chapter. Um, you know, uh, we used the, the very first MAM stack workload. Uh, we run those workload on those clouds in China. And then, then we use that actually uh, in the uh, April uh, Beijing Global Open Source Summit. So you can see those the pictures. That was very cool. Oh, you want to talk so about yeah, it? I'd like to take this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to give some credit to a lot of people who put a lot of effort into this. Um, obviously, um, you know, Tong was the rover, making sure everybody had any questions they had, he, he helped them out. And, and then when the cockroach DB surprise came out, you uh, had to go figure out some cockroach DB. So, um, and, you know, obviously Mark as well and all the others. Uh, you know, Mark was instrumental as he was in the, fa in the first phase, and making sure things worked and good decisions and, you know, being a liaison to the ref stack side and making sure the whole overall view was consistent between the, the workload and the, the, the challenge and, and what else was going on in interoperability and leading the work group. And just, you know, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of good faces, you know, names here that uh, a lot of folks did it twice and, and Egle and, and Roman, um, new folks like Mohammed stepping up, right? And um, it was uh, quite, a, quite a thing. Um, so thanks to everybody who, who got involved. Um, a lot of extended work effort that people did uh, to make this happen. Um, that's up to, Mark. any more you want to cover, Mark? This is your turn. Yeah, um, so we wanted to throw in a couple of uh, updates from the Interoperability Working Group, um, which is uh, the group that produces the interoperability guidelines that I mentioned earlier. Um, like I said, there's a, a full session on that uh, later today and a couple more tomorrow. Uh, but a couple, couple quick blurbs. Um, we asked the participants to uh, run the RefStack suite against their clouds. Um, most of them were looking at the 2017-01 guideline, which uh, was approved by the board of directors earlier this year. Um, we rolled those guidelines out on a six-month cadence, so the next one is due out in uh, uh, August of this year. Um, and we're working on the uh, scoring of new capabilities for that right now. Um, we're also looking at a couple of interesting things. One of the workloads that we talked about today was the NFV workload. Um, traditionally, what we've done in the interoperability work group is focus on sort of core capabilities for almost all OpenStack clouds. Um, what we're actually seeing now is OpenStack is such a flexible system that it's finding a lot of interesting use cases and niches that it, you know, it turns out to be a really good match for. Um, one of which, as an example, is NFE. Um, so we're actually looking at creating new uh, programs for those verticals because the way an NFE cloud is built uh, and behaves is maybe a little bit different from, say, a general purpose compute cloud, right? Uh, there may be things like PCI pass-through has to have pneumo or scheduling, um, maybe advanced data plane um, performance, um, other, other things like that. Um, so we're actually looking at some new programs to create interoperability for those. Uh, we're also looking at add-on programs. Um, if you look at what's in the interoperability guidelines today, it's really the components that are super widely deployed across most OpenStack uh, public clouds, distributions, uh, private managed solutions and what people are actually using it, even if they roll their own, right? Um, turns out there are things that are less used and interoperability for those components is still super important for the people that actually do run them. Um, so if 16% of the population is running Designate, for example, they really actually care about interoperability for Designate. Um, but it's, it's uh, kind of one of those things where we're looking at creating add-on programs for clouds that do support those extra components so that there's interoperability for those individual projects as well, um, rather than sort of just the core set. 
Um, and then we're also looking at, uh, we talked a little bit today about, um, you know, part of the interoperability challenge today was embracing a larger ecosystem. Uh, we're working with folks like Core LS, working with folks like HawkerHDB, working with uh, the Kubernetes community. Um, we're also looking at um, doing that with, with some of these vertical programs and add-on programs as well. Uh, I know we had some discussions uh, back in the line at the PTG with the OPNFE folks, um, and those uh, are continuing now. I think we're pretty close out of time, but uh, hopefully a minute or two for questions, if there are any. And yeah. there's uh, mics here. Okay, four minutes. Rocky. Hey, Rocky. <clears throat> I know, we'll have to see. I know um, someone you may know, Annie Lai, has some ideas, and so um, I promised to meet with her and, and see what we're looking at. So we're going to take a breather, and unless you all have suggestions off the top of your head. Uh, um, you know, there has been a lot of interest in NFV workloads, um, and we didn't get a chance to show that on stage because we only have about 10 minutes, um, you know, when Edward Soden is the next act. <laughs> Turns out people just kind of give you the crook. Um, <laughs> so maybe maybe we'll we'll do something in that uh, mm. realm. Um, NFV is especially popular right now in Asia Pac, and we are going to Sydney for the next summit. Um, so nothing decided, but um, it's it's something that we've already done some some legwork for, um, and would certainly be geographically pertinent. So we'll see. Uh, Monty had a session <clears throat> yesterday about pulling uh, deployer configuration. <laughs> specifics out of, you know, on a static URL out of the cloud. And I'm just curious how that would, how much of that information would be useful to automatically pull into the configs that you had, right? Things like we do, we do floating IPs, we don't do, right. you know, I'm just curious how much of an overlap there is there. Yeah, so discovery has kind of been a hot topic for a while now, um, because like I say, you know, one of the strengths of OpenStack is it is a very flexible system. Um, you know, you can adapt it to a whole lot of things. It, it, we kind of make the analogy, it's maybe a little overused, but we make the analogy to the Linux kernel. Um, you know, Linux started off as kind of a, a PC operating system, and then it morphed into a data center operating system, but it's also in Seatback Entertainment Units, it's also on my phone, it's, you know. Um, the Linuxes that you see there are different, um, even though they're all derived from a common code base. Uh, so there are a few things that have been changed in between, right? Um, so as we see OpenStack kind of moving into these uh, more niche places as well, discoverability of how a cloud acts has been a very hot topic with, um, I know the interop group is, as well as some of the folks like Monty for a while now. Um, part of what we're doing here is we chose to use Shade and Ansible, um, and a lot of that's actually reflected there. Ansible, uh, Shade will actually make some queries into the cloud to pull some of that information itself. Um, when it gets down to things like, say, IP addresses or what images are available or um, you know, some of the other like finer grain details, um, we'll have to wait and see first when those APIs come into fruition, if they do. Um, it, it's certainly the kind of thing that you know, makes sense for tools to use. Uh, and then two, we actually want to see when that's picked up by the tools ecosystem. Um, because that's something that we can offer to, say, the Terraform folks, or the Ansible folks, or the Chef folks, or the Puppet folks, or the Kubernetes folks, or you know, whatever is going to ride on top of OpenStack. Um, once those things are available, they're actually going to have to consume them. Um, and you know, there'll be a couple of iterations on that. But it's, um, discoverability is certainly a, a kind of thing that we would like to do in the future. Um, that also will raise a little bit of concerns on some of the, the cloud operators about how much information they want to expose through something like that. Um, so those are, are kind of like implementation DLs we have to work through. Anybody else? Yeah, and if you actually look at the, the Ansible variables files that we use for these, it's, I mean, it's like 20 lines or something. So, you know, it's, it's not horrible today. <laughs> it could be better, certainly, but um, it's actually not half bad. Yeah, because they contain some of the uh, Kubernetes uh, configuration parameters as well. So that makes it longer. Yep. I mean. Okay, um, I think we are about out of time. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks.